Hi, good evening and welcome. Thank you for joining our OncLive webinar, Exploring New Treatment Options in HCC. I'm your moderator, Daria Zangari, Scientific Director for OncLive, and I'm very happy to be with you all tonight. The mission of this webinar is to provide our listeners with a free-form discussion on new treatment options in HCC. We will cover a list of topics which our faculty panel will go into greater detail on. So they will cover the impact of COVID-19 has on treatment selection, screening and diagnosis, the new approval of atezolizumab and bevexizumab, and what the future looks like for HTC patients post-COVID. If you're listening to this webinar, we encourage you to submit your questions and we will try to answer as many of them as we can at the end of this program. So thank you for joining to us and thank you, thank you for joining us tonight and thank you to our faculty. So before I said I was the moderator, but actually we have Dr. El Kahiri, who's the moderator. So I'll turn it over to him to introduce himself and he will take you through this program tonight. Thank you. Hello everyone and thanks for joining us. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, hear, to be here with my esteemed colleagues and friends. Uh, so first uh, I'll introduce myself. I'm Anthony El Kahiri. I'm a medical oncologist at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. And uh, I focus a lot of my research on, in the area of hepatobiliary cancers and drug development. I'm joined by Dr. Singal from UT Southwestern, uh, where he is the director of the liver tumor program and the clinical chief of hepatology. And Dr. Kerry Frenet from Scripps MD Anderson Cancer Center in La Jolla, where she's the director of transplant hepatology. Uh, welcome to you both and thank you for being with us tonight. Thanks, Anthony. Thank you. Excited to be here. Uh, and thank you for the audience. And we look forward to your question at the end. Uh, I'm gonna get the conversation started by maybe you know setting the stage on how we are practicing and treating HCC in the setting of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so as we know, uh, we see the numbers of infections, hospitalizations, and even death unfortunately still increasing in several states. We've also seen some fluctuations across states where the numbers tend to slow down, but then pick up again. So what is becoming obvious, I think to all of us is that this is a virus that we're gonna have to coexist with uh, in different ways and adjust our practice in different ways to cope with it, where we can minimize the risk to ourselves, to our patients, but at the same time, still be able to deliver adequate cancer care. So with, with that background, I'd like to ask uh, you know, the panelists about the impact that COVID-19 has had on your clinical practices in general, not just HCC, but on, on your clinical operation in general. So uh, Amit, maybe could, could we start with you? Yeah, Anthony. So, you know, um, I, I practice down in Dallas. Um, and so, you know, initially we were relatively spared. So the biggest impact, as you know, um, of COVID-19 in the beginning were, were, was in New York and areas of Michigan. Um, and, you know, down south, we were relatively spared with less COVID-19 cases. Um, and, you know, as we saw the impact that this was ravaging um, in different parts of the United States, we still shut down our um, clinical practices. Um, and largely shut down our research practices at that time. So, um, you know, our clinical practices stopped doing most in-person visits um, starting around March, and we stopped a lot of our clinical trials across the board, not only for HCC, but across the board um, for, for most diseases, um, you know, in, inside cancer and outside cancer. Um, and we've shifted largely to doing more and more telehealth. Um, you know, as that continued and we started to see here in Texas initially that we thought there would be very few cases, we started to reopen. And I know that we're going to talk about this, you know, throughout the next, um, you know, hour in terms of the different shifts in temporal trends that we've seen. But we started to slowly increase the number of patients that we were willing to see in person. Um, and we started to increase, um, you know, the, the research trials that we had, um, trying to give people access to once again, the newer treatments that we would have coming around. Unfortunately, as you referenced when we started off the program, we've started to see a rapid rise. And unfortunately, Texas is one of those states where we're seeing a rapid increase in the number of COVID-19 cases. And so we've unfortunately now started to, to actually scale back that reopening. 
Um, and so we've shifted back to doing most of our visits via telehealth and our research trials mm -hmm. actually being once again halted at this time. Um, I think this not only impacts our cancer care, but also impacts things like doing endoscopies and doing general cirrhosis management. Um, once again, most of those going to telehealth. Um, the one final thing that I'd remark on, and then I'd love to hear what Carrie's um, seen in her practice is, you know, our practice, we've, um, from a surgical perspective, we've, we luckily have the capacity to do um, COVID-19 pre-testing in most of our surgical patients. Um, and so for, for some of the, the surgical therapies, both for, you know, um, for cancer, as well as other urgent indications, we, we typically do COVID-19 testing before. And so we've been able to largely continue our surgical practice, both in terms of resections as well as transplant. Great, thank you for that. K Kerry, would you like to share how your experience has been? Yeah, we, I've had a very similar experience to Amit when, you know, when everything started happening in March, we largely shut down our in-person visits um, and we've moved largely to telemedicine at this time. I would say we are, you know, we really still are doing mostly telemedicine. I'm probably at around 80 to 90 percent of my visits are telemedicine visits. Um, we also, for our, our both our transplant patients as well as our cancer patients, set up a lab draw station outside where the patients don't have to come into the lab. They can actually get drawn from their car um, so they don't get exposed to others. So that has been really helpful. Um, we also are pre-testing for endoscopies as well as surgeries. Um, our transplant patients, we actually continue doing transplants for the higher risk patient, which I actually went through on our list and said, you know, this person can't wait, this person can't wait, this person can't wait. And that we've opened up quite a bit as we're really getting better at testing both donors and recipients. Although I would say there's still a fair number of patients that we have that are, are unwilling to think about a transplant in this this situation, knowing that transplant patients and immunosuppressed patients are at higher risk if they do get a COVID infection. Um, so, you know, we're sort of figuring things out as we go along. We're trying to do a little more and move towards reopening, but, you know, just as in Texas, we're starting to see a surge in San Diego from across the border from Tijuana and Mexico. Um, so we're trying to balance, you know, the, the needs of our patients with the fullness of our hospitals and our ICUs. Certainly a situation that requires a lot of innovation and, and flexibility from, from all of us. And uh, my experience has been quite similar to, to both of yours. Uh, and we actually have flocked, uh, we've, uh, the only nuances I would add is we, for some patients, have gone back and forth between telemedicine and in-person as needed. And I suspect it will continue into the future, actually, because it's convenient. Um, Luckily, our therapeutic cancer trials were able to continue uh, even in the midst of the pandemic as long as we could justify the risk-benefit ratio and there was flexibility in, in, in that. So that was important to, to allow patients access to, to these uh, cutting-edge therapies. <clears throat> Excuse me. So moving on to maybe our next question, and I'll ask Carrie to comment on this. Uh, has the COVID pandemic impacted your treatment decisions? How you approach HCC patients, uh, how you how you treat them, and I know that that might vary by stage, but maybe let's start with advanced stage patients first. Sure. So when you know when the pandemic really started to become an issue, I would say one of the things that we did do is um, we would always discuss with the patient IV therapy versus oral therapy. And I would say a fair number of patients actually chose to do oral therapy because they wouldn't have to come to the hospital. They could get it delivered to their house. They would not have to leave the house. They can get labs again at the lab draw station and then do telemedicine. So they were really able to shelter in place a little bit better with the oral therapy as compared to IV. Um, we have made obviously some changes in our infusion rooms to try to keep people safe and keep them separate um, and make sure that there's adequate distancing, et cetera. And we've also tried, uh, luckily this has been around the time that we've gotten more information on how we can stretch out the time period between infusions 
um, you know, going every four instead of every four weeks instead of every two weeks potentially, or every six weeks or instead of three. Um, and we've done a little bit of that also. Um, the other thing that we've seen is, you know, we would generally do scans um, about every eight to 12 weeks, depending on the patient. And a lot of patients, if they were doing well, we would maybe delay their scans. Um, as, especially as radiology was trying to minimize, again, patient flow through radiology. So, you know, I think if somebody's been stable for a while on treatment, their labs and tumor markers didn't suggest they were progressing, we may, we would maybe delay the scans a little bit. Um, so that's some of the things that we've chosen for our advanced patient. Um, and then the earlier stage, we'll talk a little bit about more, um, you know, I think resections, we don't really have the uh, time liberty, I would say. Transplants, some of them are not people that we're comfortable waiting for. Somebody that's been listed but has only needed, say, one local regional therapy and has been stable for a year, year and a half. You know, we maybe had them on hold for a few months during the initial COVID pandemic while we were trying to figure things out and get our testing sorted out. Um, and then I know we'll talk a little bit more about local regional therapies, but that's some of the treatment choices that we've had to make with, you know, discussion with our patients that, because a lot of this is also based on patients and what they were comfortable with. Great. So, I mean, with, with I, I suspect you may have a similar um, experience, uh, and if not, please share. But I guess a related question I'd like to ask, do you have concerns that maybe by favoring oral therapy, are you compromising outcome given the recent data we have, for example, with yeah. the combination of atezolizumab, bevacizumab, and we're gonna come back to that later. But how do you make these decisions? How, how, do, how do you think through that? Yeah, I think Anthony, that that's a great question because you know, like when we were thinking of single agent, um, you know, nivolumab or pembrolizumab, you know, in light of the negative trials, I think that, you know, that decision of like, you know, should you use this in select patients or should you stick with the oral therapies, um, you know, depending on how you read those trials, you could say like, okay, fine, um, I'm okay sticking with the oral therapies. I think now in light of the recent data from IM Grave 150, um, really showing a significant bene benefit of the combo of Atezo and Bev, I think it becomes a little bit harder. Um, and so, you know, I think it changes that conversation with the patients that, of course, there's a risk of COVID exposure, but I think, you know, Carrie already mentioned that all of us have gone through and changed the infusion rooms in terms of trying to minimize the risk. Um, so I think that, you know, one of the things that we really do is obviously lay out the groundwork of the new data for atezolizumab when we talk to our patients, but we now have built in also discussing all of the measures that we take to keep them safe as they go through our health system. Now, Absolutely. despite that, I mean, Carrie, Carrie also referenced, I mean, despite us doing this, there are patients that say, I don't care what you've done. Um, I'm not willing to come to the health system um, to get my infusion because of this risk. And so they, you know, they, and, and this may change. Once again, as it surges in different areas, you may see that patient comfort doing this change. Um, yes. So I, th I think as long as you've taken the effort in terms of discussing you know, the data with the patient and they truly are making an informed decision, I, I think that patients have to do what they feel comfortable with. I think the other thing that I'd say, Anthony, is just because somebody starts on TKI therapy right now. So let's say you talk to somebody and they say, right now, I'd rather go on TKI therapy. You know, you talked about you know, being flexible and shifting. So let's say right now, you know, there's a surge, patients don't feel comfortable. Two months from now, hopefully sooner, we start to see a decrease in the number of cases. You can then revisit and say, I know you're on TKI therapy, but you know, let's rediscuss whether you want to go on combo, you know, IO, um, you know, atezolizumab. So I think that sure. it's going to, I think we have to be flexible, as you said and continue to yeah. think outside the box in this in this new era. And the one thing I would add to that also is, is practicing the art of medicine, which you alluded to. So sometimes we do risk stratify, right? This is someone with low tumor burden, good yep. liver function, no hurry. Let's go with the oral therapy versus this is someone in whom I need to get a response faster. We may not be able to make it a second line where we may have to Again, the, the risk benefit ratio justifies coming in for the IV therapy if they're comfortable yeah. Yeah. as well. Uh, and I think, you know, one of the questions were related, how are you adjusting this with the re-entry and the reopening? But I think we, we already addressed that in, in our answers. So I'm going to shift to a different angle here with Amit. Uh, 
So to speak more about screening, uh, we know that ultimately the, the best way to improve overall outcomes in HCC is by doing better screening and catching this disease earlier when we can offer more curative therapies like resection, like transplant, or ablation for, ta for small lesions. So yeah. do you think this pandemic has impacted screening? If yes, how? And, and, and how do we deal with it? Yeah. So, you know, we've seen data from many other cancers showing a sharp de decline in screening, as you would imagine. So, you know, there's data showing a sharp decline in colon cancer screening, a sharp decline in breast cancer screening. Um, and this isn't a big surprise. Um, you know, I'm not aware of any data that's looked at um, liver cancer screening or HEC screening specifically. Although, you know, we've already talked about how many of our radiology centers um, also, you know, shut down or decrease the number of patients that were going through. And I can tell you our clinical practice was, you know, we regarded HEC screening as being important, but non-urgent. And so all of our HEC screening was deferred um, during, you know, these times of shutdown, um, which as you referenced may come and go. Um, I think that, you know, so I think that you're going to see a decline. When we think of HEC screening, we have to remember that this is a repeated process. So it's supposed to be done every six months. But the annual risk of HEC, while it's substantial, is only, I mean, quote unquote, only two to three percent. So when you defer HEC screening, whether it's for short intervals, it's important to remember that it's likely to be safe for the vast majority of people. And we know that when people have underlying liver, liver disease, they're likely <clears throat> at higher risk of having COVID or uh, you know, acquiring COVID, and they're likely at higher risk of severe COVID. And so when you think of that risk-benefit ratio, I think the risk-benefit ratio is likely on the side of short deferrals for HEC screening. And what I mean by that is I would feel comfortable, for example, instead of doing this every six months, to do this at a nine-month interval or you know, somewhere around there. Now, if we get into a period of prolonged COVID surges, you know, this first wave continues to last, and you're not able to do HCC screening for extended periods of time. So let's say a year, year and a half, hopefully not. But if we get into that situation, the other thing that we can start to think about is starting to think about some of the novel biomarkers. Understanding they don't have the evidence base that ultrasound-based screening does, but once again, the art of medicine trying to apply um, less data-based um, interventions, we can start to think about biomarkers like GALID you know, AFP, AFPL3, and DCP combined with gender and age, the early data suggests that these could be accurate and can help with early detection. And so I would think that, at least in our clinical practice, if we see prolonged delays, we will likely temporarily use these biomarker strategies to bridge and then go back to imaging-based screening um, if and when possible. Great, that, that's just, actually uh, quite helpful. Gary, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to add my other worry that I have with the impact that COVID may have on screening and impact down the line is I, I think that this period of flux that we have had in the last three months that is seems like it's going to continue for another period of time. My worry that I've already been seeing is I, I think that there are going to be patients that sort of fall through the cracks as far as coming back in for their screening. You know, yeah. their screening got canceled there, you know, and then they don't ever call back to reschedule or something like that. Um, and then they may not get back into the screening situation where they're on their routine again. Um, and that may then end up in higher rates of advanced HCC in a year or two years or five years or however long it's going to be. Um, but that's just something we need to keep in mind that we need to remember to keep these patients in the system and get them back in the system when, they're de when their screening gets deferred. Yeah, no, that's critical. And, um, you know, I think the other thing um, here that, that I think we're seeing that, you know, is a little tangential to, to HEC screening, but I think the other thing that we're starting to see in a lot of our patients is this anxiety and this fear. And not only am I afraid of them dropping through the cracks, but I'm afraid of we're seeing, um, you know, resultant behaviors. You know, we're seeing a sharp increase in anxiety, depression, alcohol use. And I think one of the interesting things about HEC, we know that it's a disease within a disease. Over 90% of HEC patients have underlying cirrhosis, and the underlying liver dysfunction is always critical when we think of HEC treatments. And so um, it's been um, 
surprising and upsetting to see the number of patients that I've seen that, you know, even these people in, you know, that either never abused alcohol or um, were long-term, you know, remission now having relapses because of this resultant depression. You know, we all know as human beings, we're social creatures um, and being, you know, uh, um, stuck in your house, um, you know, intermittently quarantined is a, is, is a tough, tough process. Yeah, we've actually, I, I just saw some Nielsen data that came out recently that showed that there's been above a 20% higher sales of alcohol since the pandemic and lockdown started. And we're seeing an increase in alcoholic hepatitis, but we also see that in our patients with underlying liver disease, when you add alcohol on top of their underlying liver disease, you're now doubling their risk of liver cancer development. So yeah. I, I think that this is going to, not only are we seeing the worsening liver function, but I think we're going to see more HCC because of that. Yeah. Uh, and you know, it may speak to the importance of our continued engagement with these patients, even if it's via telemedicine or, or whatever, but this constant routine contact may be important in, in addressing some of these challenges. So we're going to shift gears now to discuss the most recent approval, FDA approval, of the combination of atezolizumab and bevacizumab. Uh, this is kind of the first combination therapy to be approved in first-line HCC and actually the first therapy to beat sorafenib uh, since its approval back in 2007. So this, as uh, Dr. Singal alluded to this uh, from the I Am Brave uh, 150 trial, which was an international phase three study that randomized patients to the combination of atezolizumab bevacizumab versus sorafenib. There is certainly ample rationale for this combination. Uh, Anti-VEGF therapy is thought to be important in uh, down-regulating some of the inhibitory cells like T-regulatory lymphocytes, myeloid-derived suppressor cells, and in in improving the recruitment of cytotoxic T cells into the tumor. Uh, so there's certainly uh, immune microenvironment effects from the anti-VEGF therapy. And we know atezolizumab is an anti-PDL1 antibody. We know that targeting PD1 and PDL1 has single agent activity in HCC. So this was the rationale behind this combination. This was a two to one randomization and we saw the results earlier, uh, actually late last year uh, in Asia, where were they first released at ESMO Asia, where uh, Atezo and BEV led to a Im significant improvement in overall survival with a hazard ratio of 0 0.58, so a 42% 40 reduction in the risk of death. We saw a significant improvement in PFS that was 6.8 months versus 4 point some months with sorafenib. And the objective response rate by Rhesus 1.1 was 27%. So certainly close to that 30% range that we've seen with these various combinations in HCC. So every endpoint was positive. And then we saw that the rate of grade three and four treatment related adverse events were actually by numbers were comparable between the two arms in, in the 50% range. Uh, but certainly many of the uh, toxicities that are difficult to handle with sorafenib, such as skin toxicity and diarrhea, were actually less frequent with the atezo combination. So again, a welcome addition to our, our, uh, to our armamentarium, and the FDA recently approved it. So this is going to be really a dominant option for our patients in, in first line. Now, with that background, I'd like to first ask Dr. Singal to comment on the eligibility of this trial and how are these eligibility relevant to our day-to-day -day practice? Do they reflect the patient population that we see? Uh, and are, are there any precautions related to that? Yeah. So, um, you know, Anthony, I think there's a couple um, inclusion exclusion criteria that are pretty standard across the board for all of these um, clinical trials and advanced HCC. So. The first is that this trial included patients with child PUA cirrhosis, and they included people with good performance status, so performance status zero or one. And once again, that's standard since you know the SHARP trial. We've seen that in all of the clinical trials in the advanced SAGE setting. Um, I think it's important when we think of our clinical practice, um, of course, we all love it when you know that child PUA patient comes in 
that patient with preserved liver dysfunction, um, well, preserved liver function, no liver dysfunction. Um, but, you know, I, I think that, you know, many of the patients we see, unfortunately, either do have more significant portal hypertension or do have complications of their cirrhosis, societies, encephalopathy, low albumin, high bilirubin, which puts them in the child QB category. And I think it's important to remember that the complications of um, this combination, a TESOBEV, may be higher in those patients with child QB. We don't know because we don't have the data. And I think one of the important things is it's one of the benefits of having a drug like serafinib is it's been around for a decade. And so we have post-marketing data showing safety in that child QB patient population. And likewise, you know, we have um, a little bit of data from nivo for nivolumab in that child QB patient as, um, from the Checkmate 040 trial. But we don't have data for this combination. And so I think that's the first big inclusion-exclusion criteria that I consider to be critical when thinking of patients for this combination. The second one that I'd say is um, that, of course, with um, any um, che immune checkpoint inhibitor, they've excluded patients with autoimmune disease, um, you know, including autoimmune hepatitis. I think, you know, as most people treating cancer who have used immune checkpoint inhibitors, I think we're all used to that. So I'm not going to spend time on that ex specific um, exclusion criteria. Overall, I think that comes around, but not nearly as often. The third one, I think, is one of the things that is unique about this trial. So this trial required all patients to have an EGD within six months of randomization. And patients um, either had to have controlled varices and they could not have had um, you know, a recent history of variceal bleeding. And this has not been done in any of the other trials that we've had to date. And I think that's one of the things that I think is important as this rolls out to clinical practice is for us to make sure that continues to happen. As you already alluded to, the tolerance of this drug was amazing. And I mean, you know that you know, Peter Gaillet presented the, the patient reported outcomes, which were equally impressive with this combination. I think all of us are, you know, think of this as a game changer. But it's really with that careful patient selection. And my fear is if we don't do that upper endoscopy um, prior to using a TESOPAV in clinical practice, we're going to see notably higher rates of GI bleeding. We know that this is something that can happen with BEV. And we know this is something that can happen with cirrhosis. BEV in a cirrhotic patient population that isn't well selected could be a mess. And that's why, um, you know, I would say keep your local gastroenterologist in bed at night. And the way to do that is to do the EGD before putting them on a TESOBEV so they don't present late at night with their variceal bleed. Thanks very much for this very comprehensive and excellent review. So, Carrie, with this background, how do you think about which patients should not get a tezobev and maybe should get sorafenib or something else? Just building on what Amit had introduced here. Yeah, so I'll I'll start to build with the varices that he ended with, and I think a couple things to realize is number one of the child of the patients with child A cirrhosis, around seven to ten percent of them have significant varices on endoscopy, meaning grade two or moderate varices or large varices. With, and potentially high-risk stigmata. Once you have varices on endoscopy, especially if they have high-risk stigmata, if you decide to band those patients, the banding ulcers can take two or three weeks to heal, and then you have to continue to band them to eradication, which can take up to three to four or five endoscopies once a month. So that would then delay treatment with a TESOBEV until you have completed that eradication. And you, you know, a lot of these patients, you don't want to wait four or five months to get them started on their HCC treatment. So that patient, I would start on serafinib while I'm getting their varices under control. And as Amit said too, if you don't do the endoscopy and they do have a bleed, um, and there's, you know, the rate of varices is much higher in patients with more advanced liver disease. So if you're thinking about, oh, child B, they'll tolerate it better. Well, those patients are also mo much more likely to have varices and they're much more likely to bleed from the varices. A cirrhotic patient who has a variceal bleed ha can die during the bleed. It's much more likely to die during the bleed if they've got underlying cancer, and they're much more likely to decompensate. So now they're a child B or a C cirrhotic, and they're no longer eligible for any systemic therapy. So it really is very, very important to mitigate that risk, and that's a patient that you may say, you know what, we, we need to get you on serafinib because we can't wait. Um, I also do worry about the patients with an underlying autoimmune disease. 
Um, and I think you have to balance, again, balance the risks and benefits. You know, how severe is their autoimmune disease? How severe or well controlled is it? You know, someone who has lupus that is not well controlled and intermittently needs steroids, they might not be a great candidate for an immuno, immuno based therapy. Um, and that patient I might think about with serafinib instead. So, um, and then of course, patients that um, are transplant candidates or recipients. We don't want to think about immunotherapy in those cases necessarily. We don't have a lot of data. There is studies that are ongoing and we'll hopefully get some data. But at this point, somebody that's got a recurrent HCC post-transplant that we're talking about systemic therapy, I would not consider them a candidate for a TZOBEV at this point. Yeah, and I think, Carrie, Absolutely. I mean, really for any immune checkpoint inhibitor, because, I mean, we've seen the rates of graft loss are exceedingly high um, in, in that yes. patient population. And so... You know, I think that all of us sometimes get tempted in that post-transplant patient because they have, you know, they often present with metastatic disease. But we've yeah. unfortunately seen post-transplant setting, it's 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 a really um, bad idea. And you're right. I mean, in the pre-transplant setting, I think we're all trying to figure out, you know, now with the, you know, responses we're seeing, et cetera, you know, the question is how long do you have to wait before it would be safe? And I think that will be mm -hmm. interesting data as it comes out. Right. But the data that we've seen in the post-transplant setting is that there's about a 30 to 40 percent risk of graft rejection that is irreversible with graft loss and death. So patients yeah. who ask me about immune, check immune checkpoint inhibitors, we have to share this data with them. And yep. I, I think that's a, a big risk to take. And a lot of patients, once they hear that data, are not willing to take a 40 percent chance of death. So if I, if I can summarize uh, what I'm hearing from both of you is that atezobev is a game changer. It is the new standard of care in first-line therapy for the right patient, and the right patient is defined by someone who has well-preserved liver function, preferably CHALP-UA. Uh, there's absence of safety data for CHALP-UB or more advanced portal hypertension in general. Uh, the adequate safety measures have to be taken with an endoscopy within six months and adequate treatment of varices. Um, patients with active autoimmune disease, of course, should not be treated with, with IO-based therapy uh, at this point. So a, a more practical question, Carrie, do you think there are challenges currently in being able to obtain a screening endoscopy prior to enrollment? And, and, and that may vary, yeah. I guess, you know. I think it depends on COVID is making things worse with that, of course, and then I think the community makes things worse as well. So um, in the in the COVID era, to get a pre-screening endoscopy, at least right now, we're having to get a COVID test before the endoscopy. And the number of endos endoscopic procedures that we're able to perform every week is directly related to the number of COVID tests that we have available to pre-test these patients. So that has made us somewhat limited on the number of scopes that we can do. And so it's a little bit of a negotiation of getting people in and we can get them in. It just takes a little bit more pre-planning. In the community setting, it's a little tougher where, you know, in my academic center, my oncologist walks down the hall or calls me up and says, hey, I need this guy to get an endoscopy and I can see them and I can schedule them for the next day. In the community setting, they're referring to the local GI who has to get them in for a visit, who has to get the labs. A lot of times in the community um, ambulatory surgery centers, they are not doing variceal screening, so the patients have to be scheduled in a hospital setting, which is much more difficult for a community GI where they don't have as many slots in a hospital setting. So, you know, these steps that they have to take with, you know, insurance off and getting it scheduled and finding a slot is a little bit tougher than it is in, say, an academic center where we're all sort of practicing in one big place. Thank you. So, you know, besides Atezo, Bev, we are seeing emerging data. We know that the nevo epi combination is approved post sorafenib. This is another immunology based combination. We are seeing emerging data with phase 1B data, for example, with pembrolizumab and linvatinib. Mm -hmm. so with any of these IO-based combinations, we have a risk of immune-mediated adverse events. And that ranges from hepatitis to dermatitis to colitis, et cetera. And sometimes these events require steroid usage. So, you know, it becomes even more tricky to think about steroid usage in the COVID era 
So, Amit, could you comment on, on how you think through that and, and whether you think, you know, there are special considerations that have to be taken here? Uh, you know, so the data on steroids, um, particularly in the setting of COVID, um, are somewhat mixed. Um, and I think, you know, are somewhat evolving given the fact that we're still in the early phases of this. So, um, Anthony, as you know, you know, at ASCO, they just recently presented a late breaker using the Teravolt um, cohort, you know, in thoracic malignancies. Um, and in that cohort, they actually looked at a multivariable analysis for prognostic factors. And in that analysis, steroid use was um, just barely associated with worse prognosis. So with a p-value of 0.052, so like just above 0.05. But you get the idea that, you know, there was a signal um, that early on that steroids may be associated with worse prognosis. Now, you know, I think everyone was willing to accept that, like, fine, that makes sense. And then, of course, you have to then interpret that in light of the dexamethasone data. And so, you know, once again, as all of us know, dexamethasone, you know, there's now the, the press release of dexamethasone, um, you know, potentially reducing mortality in light of COVID. Um, and, you know, my, inter my understanding of those data um, in terms of dexamethasone is the biggest benefit is in intubated patients but the benefit in non-intubated patients is smaller, if any, and we have very little data of dexamethasone in cancer patients. So overall, I would say right now, my, my interpretation of the data, it's a mess. And I, don't, I would say that we don't know. Um, we have data on both sides, and we have no data specifically in HCC. I think what I would say, if I, I, you know, like when I talk to my patients, I think it's a consideration, but I think that the true impact of needing steroids, we don't know what that means, and I would say that overall, if you need to use it, you should use it. Obviously, it's the type of thing where I don't think it should, I don't think that should be the main driver of IO therapy versus not. And I think if you need steroids, you should use it without considering COVID personally. Although, Great. Great. with very little data to guide that, that, that guidance. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, th there are so many confounding factors also, as you said, you know, when we look at thoracic malignancies, Patients may need steroids for various reasons, including underlying yeah. lung disease, not just yeah. immune complications, et cetera. And we know from a lot of the solid tumor immuno-oncology data that ha needing steroids to manage immune-mediated adverse events does not really compromise outcome generally. Uh, actually, there is some potential association between developing an immune-mediated adverse events and better outcomes as well in, in some smaller analyses. So it's a very controversial, difficult area with limited data, as you said. Carrie, anything you want to add on this front? I mean, I think I just would echo what Amit said. Like, you, you take care of your patient. You do the best you can. If they need steroids, you use them. Um, I always just, especially in the, the cancer patients, but in my liver patients as well, caution them about specific, you know, making sure that they're doing COVID precautions, wearing their masks, washing their hands. Um, and we do see that patients with liver disease in general are a higher risk for COVID compared to their age match colleagues or cohorts. So they just really have to be very, very careful. And I'm, I'm telling them the same thing that the AST recommends for the transplant patients, which is, you know, once society starts opening up, wait another four to eight weeks after the opening to see how the surge is going to happen before you then start coming out of shelter out of place. And we're seeing now yeah. that, the, you know, that's we're seeing the surges. So they have to continue to do the shelter in place. Yes, absolutely. So we're going to switch back to something that came up uh, tangentially earlier, Carrie, when you were talking, which is the patients with intermediate stage disease who need liver-directed therapy, whether it's taste or radioembolization. And, you know, these are procedures where patients have to come in. Sometimes they need more than one procedure. Uh, again, do, how are you handling this? Are you worried about the risk of exposure? Are you changing your approach uh, based on this? Um, I think that a couple things that we've done, you know, we're testing all of the patients coming in for to IR for procedures, just like surgical procedures. So that has helped. Um, we do, we have a discussion with the patient about, you know, if we're doing a radioembolization, we're talking about two trips to the hospital, but 
a taste, we often admit them to the hospital overnight, which is a, you know, a different set of risks. Um, although we are trying to keep our hospital um, uh, places that the COVID patients are separate than other patients non-COVID in the hospital. So really doing our best to, to mitigate the risk as best we can. We've um, been a little bit more aggressive about discharging patients after immediately after taste as opposed to keeping them overnight, depending on how the procedure's gone and how big of a procedure that they've gotten. Um, and, and I think that um, that's really what we've seen. I, I have seen some patients that we've done, we did procedures on that um, did not want to get their post-procedure scans because it happened right at the time that COVID was starting and then the scans got delayed. Um, so that I think has made an impact on some patients' cancer stages where the patients themselves decided not to go get their scans. So we're trying very hard to get them scanned in a safe way, um, but that's been a little bit difficult. Any, any different experience? No, I think that I think that Carrie hit it right on. So I mean, I think that you know, I mean, our center, I think we've used a little bit more radio embolization um, than chemo embolization. Um, I think it also parallels, um, you know, the ILCA, the International Liver Cancer Association guidelines, um, in terms of you know being potentially a little bit more down on chemo embolization than either bland embolization or radio embolization. Um, and then you know, as you know, um, you know, Riyadh has also the new data that suggests that you may not need. The mapping scan, um, if you have very small tumors, um, and you know, or, and or consider same day radioembolization, and so you know, in select patients, we're trying to be more aggressive in terms of consolidating those two visits for tear into a single visit, um, particularly during these times. Uh, great, and one comment I'll add, you know, especially with with days when we treat a patient, we do a staging scan afterwards and we see a small area of residual disease, yeah. or the patient has had a CR and then a small nodule is surfacing back and it's a centimeter or less, what we've done is we've decided, look, I think it's okay to wait another month or two and repeat imaging and then delay the second taste as the burden of disease okay. is very minimal and likely to explode in the next couple of months. So that's another Agreed. nuance. Yeah, no, that's actually that's actually very important. Is like the question of yeah. like, can you delay the treatment of these minimal diseases or small disease? And I think you can probably do that safely. Agreed. Very good. So now I want to ask both of you about how you've incorporated telemedicine uh, in general in in your practice and specifically with HCC patients. And if is this is something that's going to continue despite kind of the reopening that we're all experiencing. Well, we've definitely incorporated a lot of telemedicine. We did almost 100% telemedicine at the beginning. We're now at probably 80 to 90% telemedicine. Um, patients really like it a lot. A lot of them, some of them hate it and can't wait to come back in person. Um, but we, we are doing a lot of telemedicine and we're probably, I, I think we're probably are gonna be doing that indefinitely. We are heading in that direction to start implementing it for some easier things. Um, you know, a lot of the cancer patients, if they're sort of on, you know, early, you know, doing okay, or if it's just discussion of side effects, we don't necessarily need a full examination. We need labs. We need to be able to look at their skin and discuss their symptoms of their diarrhea or get blood pressures, but we don't necessarily need to bring them into the office for that. So I think telemedicine has been really, really useful for that. Um, I think we're also able to get some of these patients come from really far away. You know, they're out in the middle of California and they don't, they're, you know, coming from three or four hours. And with telemedicine, we've been able to actually have a little bit more visits with them as opposed to, well, we don't necessarily want you to come four hours. We'll do a nurse phone call visit instead. So instead, we're actually able to have a connection with them a little bit more frequently, which has been nice. Um, I think it's going to be hard to put the rabbit back in the hat for telemedicine. Honestly, I think we probably are going to have some form of it indefinitely, um, but we'll we'll see what happens. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, mean, I, I agree with um, I agree with Carrie. I, I think medicine was going in this direction, um, and this simply accelerated it. You know, I think that this is where we were going to be probably two years from now, and we've seen that you know that technology uptake really be quite rapid. Um, and I think that all of us, um, you know, as Carrie was mentioning, 
went to the vast majority of our patients going to telemedicine. And so, you know, likewise at our institution, we went to like 90 to 100 percent telemedicine for, you know, a brief period of time. Um, you know, at, at our center, what we've started to do is for new patients, we offer them telemedicine or an in-person visit because I think there's some people who like that first visit to see me in person, you know, and I, I mean, I, I love telemedicine, but I think there's nothing like seeing somebody and having that, you know, in-person rapport at least once. Um, and so we offer it to them. We don't mandate it one way or the other, but whatever the patient feels comfortable with. Um, but I'd say the vast majority, over, you know, 80% or over 90% of our follow-up visits um, are in person. Um, so, uh, sorry, I mean, oh, not, not in person, in, via telehealth. 90% via telehealth. <laughs> Um, yeah. Very yeah. Good. So, um, but the the new visits, I think, is where we've made that um, that flexibility of of splitting it, some in person, some uh, via telehealth. Very good. I think our last topic uh, before we open up for questions is is you know guidelines around reentry and and uh, you know maybe relaunching clinical practice as we are used to it, and and uh, I mean I'll summarize some of the institutional requirements or guidance that I've seen, you know, one is, is limiting the number of, of folks in, in any space at any one point, uh, mm -hmm. definitely social distancing within the physical space in the institution, uh, screening either by phone the day before or at the entry for all patients, but also for all staff, uh, definitely the aggressive usage of, of personal protection and, and masks throughout the institution. Um, and again, always if something can be done remotely, doing it remotely. But these are the types of guidelines that we've seen deployed for, for the re-entry. Uh, anything else that you've seen at your institutions that you'd like to share? I think that the, the only thing that I'd say is that like, you know, like our institution is carefully watching the local numbers. Um, and what they do is they they put a cap on the maximum number of people um, and patients that can be seen. And, you know, as the number of cases continue to decline, it's not like they mandate that you um, have to go back to in-person visits, but they'll loosen the maximum number that they would allow. But, um, you know, as the number of cases increase or decrease, then they continue to, to walk that back or um, loosen those regulations. But I think, Anthony, at least... For our institution, I think you've hit on the, the majority of the, the um, things that we're doing uh, at our local site. The other thing that we're doing is um, we're doing uh, check-ins from the parking lot. So instead of having the patient walk into the office and yeah, we've got the plastic screen and whatever, but we're actually having them check in from their car and then calling them to come, to then come in. So, you know, got, just in case clinics running late or something, we're now not left with a, a waiting room full of patients. Um, so really trying to minimize that. And I would say, I would say one of the biggest impacts that's been really very difficult is actually the not allowing family members in the hospital and not allowing mm -hmm. visitors in the hospital. Um, that's been really tough on patients. They're getting, you know, I would say pretty depressed when they're in the hospital and not able to have visitors. Um, and then the families are getting frustrated and, and scared because it's hard to get an update from the phone as opposed to seeing their loved one. Um, we, you know, we've tried to implement um, iPads for the patients so they can FaceTime with their families and we get the families on FaceTime when we're actually seeing the patient in rounds. So that has been um, helpful, but I, I do think the hospital situation has been tough on people. Yeah. Sure. Um, okay, so I think we're now, thank you very much both. This was fantastic. Appreciate your time and, and all the lively discussion. We're, we're, we are within the last 15 minutes of this hour. So we open it now for questions and answers. Um, and let me see if we have any so far. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions yet. So while we are waiting, um, maybe we'll ask a couple of questions uh, about all the, the excitement, uh, you know, with the new therapies and new, new data that we are seeing. Um, 
maybe we can talk about how these therapies may be incorporated into earlier stages of the disease briefly uh, while waiting to see if there's another uh, question from the audience. So yeah, Kerry, could um, you come? Oh, go ahead. Or, no, or, Kerry, I mean, go ahead. You get the comments. Uh, uh, Kerry, you go ahead. ahead. No, no, it's, I'm happy to, to hand it over. Kerry, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, I was just, I was going to say one of the things that we're seeing that we're um, you know excited about is the the data from MD Anderson uh, about using the Nebo and Ipi as as neoadjuvant prior to resection and and how that potentially may improve the outcomes of resection in those patients that are either borderline resectable or potentially decrease the recurrence rate. We need that data also. Um, but it would be great if we could get more patients to resection and, and mitigate the need for transplant, especially as we're being able to cure hep C and patients with hep, you know, who have hep C related HCC, you know, if we cure their hep C, their liver disease may be stable. They actually may not need a transplant necessarily from a liver standpoint, but if we can get them to where they're resectable or decrease the recurrence rate, that may actually be best in the long run as we're having such a, a problem with donor organs. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree um, with Carrie. You know, the, the data in terms of like ipinevo in that neoadjuvant setting was, um, was very exciting in terms of the responses that you saw um, on the surgical specimen. I think that, you know, as Carrie said, we'll have to see if that actually translates into decreased recurrence rates um, and improved survival um, long-term, but I think is exciting. And then, I mean, as both of you know, there's also a lot of trials going on combining, you know, um, checkpoint inhibitors um, and combos with local regional therapy, whether chemoembolization, radioembolization, SBRT. Um, and, you know, these therapies have been highly effective, but if we can, you know, take it from a median survival of around three years and move it to five years or, you know, longer, that would be um, another way that we could really advance um, the field. And so I, I think those, those trials are all really exciting to me. And then I think the other thing that I would say is exciting is, you know, we talked about how um, I am Brave 150 is a game changer in the advanced HEC field. And we talked about the higher responses, but I think the other thing that's exciting is the idea that you may even be able to downstage some of those advanced HEC patients all the way down to either local regional therapy or even curative therapy. I think that's where that would be super exciting. And so the idea of, you know, the, the BCLC becoming one big jumbled like combo um, is, is actually really exciting. Absolutely. Great. And I think here I'll also mention the fact that our ongoing phase three trials looking at uh, adjuvant therapy post resection with, with nivolumab, pepralizumab, and with, with atezobev as well. So a lot of excitement about moving these successes of systemic therapy into earlier stages. There are a couple of questions from the audience uh, that I can share uh, briefly. Uh, so, you know, one of the challenges post atezobev is a lot of the data that we've had on second line and third line therapy was generated in the sorafenib era. So the data we have Rego on on cabozantinib, uh, on even single agent nivolumab, pembrolizumab, those were generated in the post sorafenib setting. So one of the questions about you know using lenvatinib in later lines of therapy or or what do you do post atezobev in general? So uh, I mean, do you want to try to tackle that first? Yeah, I, I think there's two approaches that I think you could do. So you could consider a tezobev to be like the T minus one. And so then you could say after a tezobev, I'm going to use either serafinib or len as your new second line. And then you move all of the other agents, you know, Rigo, Cabo, Ram into the third line. And so you just shift it down. Um, the other approach is to make it so there's one big box after a tezobev. And so you put serafinib, you put len, you put Rigo. Cabo, et cetera, all in that big box. And you say, I'm going to be able to choose whichever agent I feel best is for my patient. Um, I think all of us are going to have to figure this out by ourselves. The nice thing is there's no wrong answer. Um, the only uh -huh. wrong answer is not to do anything. So as long as you like have some rationale and you decide to move forward, I think you're okay. Um, but I mean, I think there, you know, the one thing you can say is, I think there are some people who say like, that's wrong. And I would argue, we don't know. There's no data after a Tizobev. And so, you know, as long as you consider all of these agents, I think you're fine. Um, the, to me personally, to me personally, Anthony, the one that I think you could argue after a Tizobab, it may not make sense to do single agent IO um, because you've already done an IO agent. 
And personally, I also think there's less um, rationale to use RAM because you've already hit that you know specific VEGF pathway. But the TKIs, you're you're acting higher. You're acting on multiple other pathways. So there's rationale to use the TKIs in whatever order you want after a TESOVET. Thank you. Very, very helpful. But certainly an area where we certainly need more data and more development, uh, for sure. A couple of other questions here. Uh, one is related to the impact of COVID on, on restricting uh, the access of medical device reps uh, supporting cases. And certainly if I, I don't do surgery and I don't do transplants, so I wouldn't be able to answer this. I know the access to visitors in general uh, and any reps or monitors has been restricted at all institutions. Uh, anything that Amit or Kerry want to add to that? Uh, I mean, that's just the reality. I mean it's a reality that yeah we're limiting all reps um you know if i need something then i i know i call my rep and they mail me whatever it is or i had once that i needed something like a starter kit or something and he met me in the parking lot um we i would say one of the other things that was a little bit of an unexpected impact is you know we've had to move all of our meetings to zoom meetings or skype meetings instead of having our tumor boards in person and i don't know what your guys's experience has been but i find it's a little tougher to get the interaction the same level of interaction that we used to have um you know with the zoom meetings and skype meetings and you know you've seen us sort of accidentally talk over each other and then no you go first no you go first and just trying to get that same level of discussion on the patients has been a little challenging um so i think we're we're figuring it out as we go but i i personally am looking forward to in-person meetings again for yeah. sure uh, Go ahead. We're just we're just uh, highlighting uh, Carrie's point there. We're just trying to exactly exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> role playing. Uh, okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll take a step at the last question here. Uh, it's talk, uh, is asking about some level of pseudo progression. Um, you know, certainly the idea of pseudo progression came out with IO therapy, especially in the setting of melanoma. Uh, how valid this is in the setting of other solid tumors is remains a bit controversial. Uh, there is no question that when we look at the single agent IO data, like for example, Checkmate 040 with nivolumab, there was about 20% of patients who had initial progression and then later stabilized or had a, a small response. So certainly if the patient is clinically doing well, uh, you know, maybe clinically benefiting even, and and you think it's reasonable to continue beyond progression and restage at a short interval of about six weeks, I think that would be reasonable to do because there's a small subset of patients who may then stabilize, especially if the progression is based on a, you know, a small non-specific nodule in the lung or liver or, or like a 22% increase rather than 20% increase in target lesions. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be my short answer to that. Um, any closing comments from Amit or Kerry before we, we summarize and, and close in the last two minutes? Um, I, I just know, think this has been a difficult time and we're all, everybody's doing the best they can and we're all learning best practices from each other. So that's what we gotta do is learn best practices from each other. Yeah, Great. Um, you know, I, mean, I agree, um, Kerry, you know, it's, it's been such a, it's, you know, COVID has been definitely a curveball, something we never expected to ever happen um, in the US. Um, you know, let alone globally. Um, but, you know, I'd say that it's also been surprising to see how well we've come together to get through this. Um, and, you know, I think the other thing is um, it's been nice to see continued progress on the medical fronts otherwise. Um, and so, you know, um, I think seeing successes like I am Brave 150, you know, and all these trials that are coming out, it's an exciting time for HCC despite COVID. Um, you know, we're not letting it ruin the birthday party completely. Um, you know, so it's the type of thing where we're still seeing advances, we're still seeing improvements in survival. Um, and I think that we have to take these small successes and, um, and take it as a, as a small win um, as, as we continue to see progress in this devastating disease. Very nice, fully agree. And it's an invitation to all of us to continue to engage in, in clinical trials, clinical research. This is really how we, we have advanced the field. And important that we also really understand 
the data fully as it is as, as we deploy it to, to our patients. So we do it the, the safest way and the most efficient way possible. So I wanna thank the audience for joining us. I wanna thank you both, Dr. Singal and Frenet, for the excellent uh, commentary and, and lively discussion. This has been a great session and I wish everyone a good evening, good night. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thanks, Anthony. Bye-bye.